to do the things that make you feel the love Gotta think about it, gotta dream about it Gotta find a way to do the things There we are. Hello, hello. We are here. All right. We've got a couple people on already. All right. Including the Goldens. The Is Goldens. that you, Drew? Is that you, Drew? It might be Rachel. Could be Rachel. It says it's Rachel. Yeah. She's on, on her, her account. Uh, if you're out there, let us know how you're doing. What are you doing tonight besides watching us and yeah. hanging out with us? And what is the weather like up there where you are <laughs> or down there where you are? Because yeah. this is, we're from Minnesota. It's obligatory yes. weather chat time. Yeah. 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 It's Rachel, I think. All right. I don't imagine that Drew's on his I don't know. The first, Facebook account. The first live chat that ever happened. When you were in Wisconsin, it was just me screwing around. It was Drew. Oh. And Drew super chatted me. Thank you, Drew, for that. Appreciate oh, appreciate it, that, Drew. But on his mom's account? Uh, yes. Oh. So, all right. Mom's in the house. Mom and dad are in the house. Welcome. Hello, hello. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. So how's the weather over on your side of the, of the studio? I'm cozy. I got my nice sweatshirt on and... I was I was going to share it with you, but I decided it's just mine. <laughs> Karen bought a communal sweatshirt, which it's, we've had several see, it's, communal it's sweatshirts. It's like a baseball. Oh, where's the camera? Yeah. St. Francis baseball. But we've had as several. As it turns out, it's mine. We've had several communal sweatshirts in our marriage, and it was kind of yeah. like first one in the closet gets it. What were the one? Have you gotten any? Yeah, we had the zip up one from Old Navy that was super oh, comfy. Oh, that was a nice one. We used you to be got like that one. racing to get out the door to see who got the, the communal sweatshirt first. I didn't first. win that one. No. <laughs> oh, Kathy goes, it's 103 degrees here. It was 103 Holy degrees moly. in Minnesota last Saturday. Yeah. No bueno. Not, Baseball tournament. And we, we were like dying. Yeah, we sat. It was horrible. We sat outside for two days for one of Jack's baseball tournaments and it was like. Nope. Death. It was like death. Nope. Yeah. And uh, it was not a dry heat. So <laughs> I know some people say that, like, what, what was it a dry heat? It's like, no. no. There was nothing dry about it, actually. I have a coworker who lives in Arizona, and it was like 114 there or something like that. And See? people are like, but it's a dry heat. No, that's just, <laughs> like, it shouldn't, that's like, that's like one of those numbers that's just wrong. Like people say when it gets freezing cold in Minnesota and they're like, no, like that's just wrong. You shouldn't, nobody should be like living and surviving <laughs> where in a place where it gets to be that temperature. I feel like that's the same, like Arizona, Texas, like they hit hot temperatures that are, no one should live in that kind of heat. So counterpoint, uh, <laughs> he did say that when you get out of the pool, you basically don't have to dry off. I can see that. It evaporates so quickly yeah. that you're just like, don't need to dry off. And you probably don't want to. Like yeah, you it probably, probably want to cool. Yeah, to for that off. two seconds yeah. before you're on fire. But we're here in the basement studios of Daily Grower and also <laughs> known studio. as my office where yeah. I work. And I typically am wearing the same thing almost that I do in You've the winter. You've worn this for like the last couple shows. That's because it's light, but it keeps my arms warm. Oh. Uh, basically during the winter, I wear the same thing. I wear a hooded sweatshirt and jeans, but I wear multiple pairs of socks. Tonight, just one pair of socks, so. Thank you for showing. I don't know if they would have known what your socks were like otherwise. Well, just yeah. one time. All right, so. <laughs> I guess no more of that. Karen says no more socks no, showing. No more socks. 
Phyllis so, is here. No way to go, Phyllis. Phyllis is here. And also, as always, I mean, this, folks, this is a professional run operation. <laughs> show notes. They like when there you, they are. They like when you show them. <laughs> show me the show notes. So uh, I've heard that. I've gotten feedback. People have said, we love the show notes, especially when Randy specifically shows feel... them. So we know that they're really there because otherwise. Are you, are you mocking me? Maybe just a little. <laughs> no, did anybody really say that? No. Nobody said that. Total mockery. All right. Kathy <laughs> says, this will be my last chat before heading to Alaska to process fish for the summer. Ooh. So I'll be out of the heat soon. Wow. Tell me more about that. I would love yeah. to know more. Where in Alaska? And what kind of fish? How did you get hooked up with that gig? Yeah, super cool. And also because I've run out of things to watch on like Netflix and Amazon Prime because I wasn't feeling well like last week, which is why we didn't have a live stream last week. And so I was watching some Alaska Outdoors TV show and it wasn't really great high quality production, but it's still Alaska. They had a lot more hunting, which I love to watch hunting stuff in the winter, but I want to watch more fishing stuff right now. They just didn't have as many fishing episodes as I wanted. So tell me all about it. I would love to hear it. That is quite, that is quite the, the transition of Arizona to Alaska. Adventure. What an adventure. Yeah. I've always wanted to like, you always wanted to go and clean and gut fish all day. No, (laughs) not really. That actually has not been part of a dream of any kind of dream I've ever had. But because going... if that's the case, when I bring fish home from fishing, mm-hmm. you can, I don't know you how can to practice. Do that. I don't even know how to do that, nor could I learn. I'm incapable, actually, of learning how to lay fish. All right. I, my my I mean, dad my dad tried to show me once and I'm pretty bad at it, but I'm getting better. It just takes practice. You are. I saw you do it the other day. You looked like you really had a knack for it. Uh, I don't know if I have a knack for it, but I I filleted a walleye and I didn't waste it. So that's that's kind of what I'm happy. That might be a knack. North Star Prep Setters in the house. Hello, hello. Kathy, our esteemed colleague in moderation, and that means a colleague who moderates, not a colleague in moderation. We, you, that was a joke, but I don't think it landed. No, it didn't. (laughs) Fell flat. (laughs) Fell flat. So tell us more, Kathy. Go about the. Finally, a break in the about, weather. About the move Goodness. to Alaska. We'd love to hear more about that. So, yeah. yes, it is a break in the weather here. It's been in the 90s to upper 90s for the past week. Really hard on the broiler chickens. Uh, lost two this morning, mm. which is unfortunate because they go to the butcher on Wednesday. So yeah. that means they're basically a total waste. total waste. Yeah. But it happens. We decided to grow... Cornish cross this year and I just kind of forgot how how um you know how um what, what's the word I'm looking for they're they're se- not sensitive they're just they're touchy they're they're not resilient how about they're that they're fragile they're fragile thank you she always has the they're words. like fragile beasts fragile. because they don't look fragile they look like like, um, what is, what does Justin call them? Sea monsters? <sighs> Kathy's got it too. Fragile. 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 All right. Kathy yeah. says she's going to Dutch <laughs> Harbor on a processing boat in the Bering Sea. Pollock salmon cod. You can work up to 16 hours a day, seven days a week, so you can make your money on the overtime. So what do you do for, like, accommodations? Are you sleeping on the boat? Uh, do you go into the harbor and get, like, six hours of sleep and then go back out, eat breakfast and do it all over again? Or how does that all work? I am super excited because I've seen Deadliest Catch, you know, 10 years ago, but I want to know how it really, is it really like that? Or is it, you know, or is it nothing like that? But tell tell us all about it. Um, I'd love to hear about it. So, um, but yeah, I would love to go to Alaska too. My parents went to Alaska and you know, the one thing that they said they didn't expect that was a little weird is that there's only five species of trees in the whole oh, state. Interesting. And I'm just looking at a, you guys can't see it. There's a poster on my wall cause I'm a dork of all of the native trees in Minnesota. You are kind of a tree nerd. You, you like, you geek out on trees. And so there's bit. about 40 to 50 on that poster. 
uh, ranging from cedars to firs to maples to oaks to elms to larch, which is a tamarack, uh, hickory, honey locusts, ash trees, although there's not a lot of ash trees anymore. Uh, emerald ash borers taking care of all those. Uh, elms, stuff like that. So I do like trees. I wish I could walk into a forest and just look at trees and be like, oh, that's a nice elm right there, but I, I'm not. I'm not getting that good at it yet. I got oaks, maples, and spruces, locusts. Those those are probably birch and and uh, uh, aspen. I can I can do those because I I see those a lot while I'm hunting. So anyway, I, back on the on the show notes, people. Um, what's next here? <laughs> she loves the show notes, folks. <laughs> Me and Phyllis, we just can't get enough of the show notes. All right, let's do a wins of the week, folks. All right, wins of the week. Kathy says she has a really big ash tree in her yard. That's super cool. Nine folks on. Thanks for showing up. The win of the week. Karen, do you want to tell everyone what the win of the week is? What my win of the week is, or just in general? Just introduce the segment. Oh, we? of course. I'd be happy to. I told you, Delighted, we, we do something a little different every week on the live show. And this week, I am surprising Karen not only with multiple things, but also making her announce the segment. So go ahead. Oh, okay. The win <laughs> of the week is where you talk about your win of the week. So if you had something that that where you felt like you personally won either on the homestead or just really anything, we want you to share about it because there's nothing better than like sharing something positive, something good that happened in your week and just being able to like cheer each other on. So yeah, we like to talk about what our win was this week. Yes. Sometimes we have more than one and sometimes we share the more than one, but so we this usually, is the we part, try to keep it, this, you know. This is the so part where you take focused. your keyboard and you type into the chat, this is my win of the week. Yeah. And my dad actually told me his win of the week already this oh, week. Oh, so, spoiler. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you type it in the chat just like Kathy did there, North Star Preps there did. Don't be shy now. Everyone has one. Even if it was a really bad week. We didn't have a really, we had a couple of downers this week. Yeah. But we still have wins of the week. We have. We've had, yeah. And then I also always let Karen go first because. Well, and I'm prepared. Because she so, wasn't, she wasn't prepared the first couple times we did this. And so I was like. Well, I didn't know we were going to do it every time. <laughs> it was like, I, you don't always clue me in on the show notes. So then I come in here and it's like a big surprise. In case you haven't seen the show notes, they're right here. Yeah. Randy. Professional Randy, operation. Yeah. He keeps notes of the shows. <laughs> um, he movie. Anyways. Right. My win of the week would be that we have had all this crazy heat for Minnesota and I have successfully weaned our bottle lambs. Hmm. How many? Two. Two bottle lambs. And they're still alive. So fingers crossed they stay that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're looking really good. Dude especially is grazing really well. Delano, aka Larry the Lip, he's the he's our little lamb with the overbite. Um, this is when he walks. Up he's to adorable, like but he, I, I've seen him grazing, but I can tell like he really has to work for it. So he's gonna just be little. I mean, well, a lot of people that I've seen said if you give them a little extra time, they'll they will catch up. They just gotta figure it out so, on their, their own way, right? Well, he just, I mean, he just needs that much more length on the grass to be able to grab a hold of it. Yeah. So, like, when he gets into an area where the grass is really long, he can get in there and grab grab stuff. But if it's shorter, which they're almost done with that front, front pasture that isn't super great. Mm -hmm. And then we could get them out somewhere where there's more length on the grass. Yeah. But I've been also thinking that I might like as the kids are mowing that I might have them take bag some of the mowed grass and dump it into uh, where the rams are yeah, that's an so interesting that, idea. so that he can have loose stuff to pick I've, up. I've tried it before. I've dumped grass 
and they have not, they just haven't cared. Well, see, I don't, because I think they would prefer to get the fresh grass that hasn't been cut. I wonder if we put it in like a hay feeder. That but, would be like, mess with their mind and they'd be like, oh, look it. But it wouldn't surprise me if he took to it because he's, because he's working hard. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So that's an idea. And then um, the other idea, I've, I've talked to some other sheep farmers that suggested like, oh, you could supplement. But most people said they, they figure it out. If they're, if they're hungry, they'll figure it out. So he wasn't grazing a whole lot before when I started weaning. And I, that's what was making me nervous. But now that he's not getting any bottles anymore he's he's working on it yeah that's good all right so kathy's win kathy number one win was got all of her new replacement raised beds installed and planted Ooh. even in the heat wow that must have been treacherous hopefully you were like doing it in the morning before it got above 90 degrees or in the shade or in the shade yeah that works too oh, then no. uh kathy number two down in arizona somehow she has two tomato groups Two tomato plants still growing, even though it's hot. The rest of the grow bag garden is pretty much fried. That is, that is common. Yeah. I think of a lot of people around here. Our garden is maintaining. It's not really growing. It's just kind of in stasis right now. And I, I hundred percent give the credit to the back to Eden style of gardening because the soil actually is still wet mm -hmm. underneath the wood chips. Um, well, we did have that and I'm not watering it. So, right. But we had, it was like, we had a dry spring and then we had like, what, how, what a week and a half or so that we got rain almost every day. Yeah. It was great. All the pastures and, just were super green. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So now the pastures are looking brown crunchy, again. Crunchy but. and gross. Yeah. So lots of tomato wins. That's good. Glad to hear that. Um, we have we actually have tomatoes growing on the vines right now, uh, which I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I don't know oh, if they should not? be producing fruit so quickly, but no, that is a good thing. That's I mean I we want if if we can get a little longer season in Minnesota, that's never bad. Yeah, I don't know. There's kind of a problem though if it starts fruiting too soon, then it'll stop growing and then it won't fruit as much as it could. You want to get a lot of good growth and then you want it to transition to fruiting Oh, as a, instead of like sometimes when it's really stressed and it's bad, it fruits right away because it's like, oh, quick, I got to produce my ancestor or produce, you know, yeah. my uh, my children real quick before I die. Well, so if we, we don't pulled, want that if we pulled a little bit of that fruit off, would it go back to growing instead of fruiting? Um, Typically, there's ways that you can do it just by fertilizing. Like, mm -hmm. if you just give it straight nitrogen, it'll be like, oh, it's time to grow again. Mm -hmm. If you give it a much more balanced NPK, something with more phosphorus and potassium that it uses to produce fruit, then it'll be like, oh, it's time to fruit. Okay. So sometimes people have the opposite situation where they have a big green plant and it's lush and fantastic but it never produces any fruit. Yeah. If you remember two years ago when we planted tomatoes, we planted into previous area that was where chickens were. And so it was completely full of chicken manure from the year before. And it was like all these huge, green, beautiful tomato plants and not a lot of fruit. Yeah. So you can have kind of a, you, you can kind of have, you know, a, a good or bad thing there. It's always good to just have some balance. And let the plant do what it's, what it's going to do. Kathy O says, I'm going to pull everything except the tomato and offer the grow bags on my neighborhood group. If they keep the bags moist, they'll be off to a good start for a fall garden. That's true. Hopefully someone will be able to use it and work on that. Uh, my win of the week this week would be that Maddie, our uh, poultry manager at Sealybrook Farms, our farm, and I went up on Thursday to um, deliver the first batch of chickens to the processor. So that was cool. How many, nice how done. many went out of how many we started with? So we got 102 from the hatchery. We put 96 out on pasture. Two of them are unaccounted for <laughs> on pasture. Really? Yeah. Like they just disappeared? I think, you know, when you're counting that many chickens, sometimes you don't count correctly. Oh. But I also am pretty sure that I took one or two really little ones and moved them to the other group that's on pasture that's just a week behind them. Uh, 
just because they were too small. And I didn't really want the other ones to maybe gang up on them. And yeah. then they would get an extra week to grow. An extra week or two. Well, yeah, an, uh, just a week mm-hmm. to grow. And then, you know, it's okay to raise Cornish cross a little bit longer. Usually it's some of the hens that are smaller. Yeah. But all of them are really good. So that's my win of the week. The, the, the bad news of the week is that we lost six of them once we put them in the crates and took them up to the processor. And that really, really stinks because those are birds that were like ready to process um, mm. and really kind of frustrating. Yeah, that's a bummer. Because you raise them all the way up to 56 days or whatever it was, and then you lose them. And I don't know if we lost them the night before or if we lost them on the way of the processor or if we lost, or if they were or lost, you know, at the processor. But well, right, with the way the like... heat was, you know, it was a it was a pretty tough week for chickens in general. Yeah. And we're we're kind of used to having uh, the Freedom Rangers, which are like bulletproof. I mean, it's pretty yeah. hard to lose one of those things, especially once they're out on pasture. Predators notwithstanding. Um And I just kind of realizing that Cornish can be quite a bit more fragile. Um, Alyssa, welcome. She says, we haven't lost any chickens through the heat. The fan seems to be working. Lost a blueberry bush. (laughs) Um, I I would be sad losing either of those, actually. Um, My mom has her one up there, too. half price flowers at Otten Brothers Flower Farm in Delano. Everything's half price. We're going to be in Delano tomorrow. Do we need flowers? Well. We might. It's a flower farm. We should go regardless. Yeah, so for sure. That's exciting. Uh, Maureen, send Karen a link or something so we can look at it tomorrow. Maybe after J- Jack's baseball games, we'll go take a look. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so we lost two this morning as well. And I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. We typically don't lose them in the heat. But when, uh, when it happens, it's always kind of like... You know, yeah. I think that especially when they're this that late in the game, like they're almost to the end, to have had the sustained heat, it's like some of them, they just were, they weren't meant to make it through that much stress. Like the heat is stressful for them. So yeah, some of them are, are going to do just fine. And then it seems like some are just... It's funny. It's, if if the per- conditions had been perfect, those ones probably would have been fine. But yeah, they had a rough yeah. life here this spring. <laughs> they endured snow, uh, freezing rain, high winds, drought, intolerable heat, freezing cold weather, and uh, no predators. <laughs> so that, it was a rough spring yeah. for, for chickens. So I... Uh, I, I'm glad that we have not lost more because yeah. I do know some other farmers that lost significantly more to the heat. Yeah. Um, and so I'm glad that we didn't didn't lose more than that. So anyway, that's uh, our wins and a not so much win. The other the other not so much win is that we found out that our daughter Elsa, who is seven, yes, has Lyme's disease. And well, she just got it. We caught it, it early. Caught it early. So, so she's, uh, she's got meds that she's taken for the next couple of weeks. And I'm always just kind of worried that, you know, there's people that have this chronic Lyme. Yeah. And then there's people that, you know, have end up with Lyme disease and never knew, you know, never knew they had it or something. And so I'm just, I'm just kind of thankful that we know that she has it. She had the big bullseye rash on her arm. Uh, and I also feel kind of guilty because I've been like pushing all of the kids to get outside and go play. Pandemic's over. Winter's over. Get outside and go do. And she's the one that plays outside the most. And she set up this cute little restaurant. She calls it, she calls it her mint shop. <laughs> yeah. She set up this like cute so little restaurant. Cute. Yeah. Uh, underneath out in this pasture and <clears throat> and in the. Uh, She's always walking in the shop and asking me to help her build stuff for it. And so we built like this, uh, like thing to put pots on over her fake fire pit. And, you know, she, she 
cooks fake soup over it and stuff. And it's just, it's really sweet. And it's just like the total perfect yeah. childhood. And then she ends up, you know, getting Lyme's yeah. disease from it. So I, I'm pretty sure she'll be okay, but she it's will. just a little sense of worry. She's already like do, feeling better and kind of, She's bouncing yeah. back. So we also, <clears throat> excuse me, we also had friends here for the past week. And uh, and that was like, she was going and going and going. And she has a, a girl that's her same, you know, roughly same age that they're playing. And they were getting up early and they're just playing so hard. And they're out in the sun and they're swimming all day. And so she just looked just spent, exhausted. like totally yeah. exhausted. Yeah. And then she started like going to sleep and we made sure she was getting to bed on time, but she was still exhausted. I mean, she was laying on the couch, just like, <laughs> I was like, Which... Elsa, are you okay? And she was like, mm, you know, just really lethargic. And she was all of a sudden she was just burning up hot Yeah. and started getting achy and stuff. And, well, Gracie, and, Gracie was the hero because she's the one who noticed the bullseye rash. Yeah. Um, did she know that it was? Tick, she did. Tick related. Yep. Hmm. She told she told Elsa that she had to come in and show me uh, that that she thought she had a tick bite. Well, Elsa freaked out because she thought she still had a tick on her. So she came in. She's like, "Mom, Grace said I have to show you. I have a tick. I have a tick." And she's like pointing, and I'm like. Well, the tick's not there anymore, but yeah. you definitely have a bite that is very suspicious and we need to have it checked out. So. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, we've known people that have had Lyme disease before. My mom had Lyme disease. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it takes a while to get over it. Yeah. But I think she'll pull through. She's a, she's yeah. a good sport. Well, I mean, she's only, she's on day two of her antibiotics out of 14 and she's already yeah. significantly better today than she was yesterday like even when she is in the house she's always playing and she's very you know play oriented and very creative and yeah. I mean, she was just like <laughs> and um, now today she's found some blocks in her room she's playing with those and it's like okay Elsa's back we, yeah we got Elsa back so uh, thank you, Kathy. I appreciate that. Yeah. It is kind of sure. like her imagination station uh, at Mr. Whitaker's or Wits End. Is yeah. What it's yeah. 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 Uh, ticks seem really bad this year. We're stripping every day. Everything is right in the dryer. Yeah. I mean, the same thing. I actually went today and I mowed a path through her mint shop. And everything so that if she wants to go back through there, she doesn't have to walk through tall grass because I went back there. I haven't been there in a while. No. Well, and the grass just took off. Some of the grass is up to my waist, which would be like here for her. So yeah. it, it totally makes sense. And it's under this big, long tree that drapes down. It's it's almost like, it's not a willow tree, but it, it almost seems like it with how no. far it comes down. And so it's, it's totally is it makes sense. Is a maple? Sense. No. I wish I... I should. You should learn more about trees. Uh -huh. um, I don't know what tree. It's a big, big tree. Though. It is a big one, but mm -hmm. it, it cracked in a storm. And so there's one brand or one big limb that goes, uh, you know, way far down and you can get deer ticks falling out of trees. You can get them on grass up too. So it, it doesn't surprise me at all that, you know, if there was one person here that was going to get it. Yeah. It would be her. Yeah, because she's been out there so much. Yeah, and we did find, we did find more like wood ticks on us this year than I think yeah, any year there, that we've well, ever there, been here. There was like a week or two where they were just super prevalent, and then it seemed like they were just gone. Yeah, um, which isn't super un uncommon. I feel like there's usually a week or two where like dogs and the cats, I'm like pulling them off and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I I agree, Kathy. And, well, both Kathy's. Uh, Got double Kathy Yeah, tonight. getting to uh, finding it and getting her started on antibiotics, which are not, I'm not, I, I mean, when they're needed, I'm glad that, to have them, but I don't love doing antibiotics. But this was one where it was like, as soon as I saw that rash, we did a virtual appointment within like an hour with her pediatrician. She took a look at it. 
and uh, got us meds right away and we got started immediately. So yeah, no, no messing around with limes for sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, maybe for the future, we'll make sure that I'll make sure that I get back there and mow a little bit more. Yeah. I, I, in fact, after I saw how bad it was, I went and I mowed paths for you. Okay. For okay. all of yeah, the fences. Yeah, because the sheep are coming back there yeah. like this week. The sheep will be there quick. So yeah. I made, mowed paths, paths for all the fences for Good. you. Thank you. Uh, and then I, I mean, I was in the thick of it. I mean, I was on the lawnmower and the, the top of the grass was over the top of the lawn. Oh my goodness. And so I just took all my clothes right away after doing all that stuff. I'm like, yeah. I'm done with this. And the so, all right. So if you're watching the replay on this, make sure you put your win of the week into the chat or a comment. Sorry. And uh, we'd love to hear about that too. I do read the comments on these and, and respond to them. So even if you can't be here with us live, we can still interact and have fun. And that'd yeah. be cool. Do um, the sheep the sh get ticks? They do not. So the sheep have the Maybe we benefit. Maybe put on wool coats. Well, it's not just the wool. It's the lanolin. Yeah. Actually. Um, seems to deter most blood-sucking insects. <laughs> yeah. uh, they can get fleas, but they're not super, it's not as common as with like dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why the, the thick wool and the lanolin makes is like a protective barrier kind of. Yeah. So, um, or maybe it's a deterrent. I don't know. Maybe the, the insects don't like yeah. the smell of it or something, but not true with flies though. They get flies on their belly and on their legs, on their rear ends. If they don't have a tail. Yeah. Well, and on their ears. they can. Yes. And the gnats too, but they're actually pretty good about like when the, in the evening, when the bugs are coming out or whatever, they'll um, lay down to keep the bugs off their legs and their belly. And then their whole body is protected. The only thing that really gets like gnat bites and stuff like that are their ears yeah. when they're so, yeah, in fact, the other night we were out moving them and there was one you that was laying down while she was eating and Randy was like, is she okay? And I was like, she's just keeping the bugs off of her. She knows what she's doing. She didn't look okay. <laughs> <laughs> she looked fine. Uh, it just, it does look a little goofy for them to like have their feet tucked under them and be like munching around on yeah. the grass around them. But. Uh, can we rub lanolin on us to prevent ticks and ugly cupcake? Welcome says, does that mean wool coats coat? clothing or natural deterrent or is that lost during the processing uh, uh well I, I mean the processing of the wool most of the washing and stuff takes out a good portion of the lanolin that's how you get rid of the sheep smell you might it might be some degree of a deterrent but i don't know that I mean, it would be let's, let's also be honest the tick would have to crawl through at this point with our sheep almost an inch or more of really thick, wiry, yeah. like, and gooey stuff to get down to their skin. So, well, on their, where their wool is, right, but where the wool. hair is, that's not very thick. But that is, like, in their armpits and stuff, they, it, the lanolin is really heavy. That's true. So they, um, yeah. I know of people that live in Siberia, they somehow extract this like tarry goo out of the the bark of birch trees oh and they yeah. rub it all over their face and skin and rub it all over their dogs faces and everything as a mosquito repellent hmm. i don't know if it does ticks too but they're all like trappers in the winter and then when they get to when they live in siberia in the short summer that they have they're just like i assume it's kind of like an alaska situation where they're just sort of destroyed by mosquitoes all the time all day long all night long. Mm. Uh, here we get at least a reprieve in the middle of the day yeah um when it's hot so yeah yeah i don't know farmer brad welcome ticks have been bad for you too yeah yeah i don't know it's been pretty bad uh sure the doc told you but if she's on doxy wear a hat outside i was she's given not. it in the army for malaria protection and made yeah. my son sensitive burn my scalp yeah no. so Doxycycline, tetracycline, all those cyclines, yeah. they all need some protection. If she were older, that's what she would have. But because uh, of how young she is, they just, it's moxicillin. So, um, 
strong enough, but as far as antibiotics go, that's not one of the real, like, super heavy hitters. Yeah. 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 So, like I said, we don't... Antibiotics, you know, we use them for... When, when when you need when to needed. and not yeah. when you not and I, when you don't and need I it. hope not to need them too often. Yeah. I try. I did throw some oils on her tick bite though, or on the rash, and and so she actually had something new. I learned is that the bullseye rash is not necessarily where the bite occurred. Hmm. Um, it can the bullseye rash can show up somewhere else, and the bite may have happened elsewhere hmm. and sometimes you see the bite like a mark where the bite was and sometimes you don't well on the same side of her body so on her it was like on the back of her um right shoulder kind of just outside of her armpit is where the bullseye rash showed up but a couple of days before we saw that i would noticed she had this like almost like a light bruise on her right leg. And I asked her about it and she was like, Oh, I don't know. It doesn't hurt or anything. Well, then a little while later, she said her leg was sore and you know, she's growing and stuff. It's like, you never know with kids and she, she didn't seem to have any like limited mobility. So I didn't think much of it at that point, but I think she actually got bit on the leg and that where that bruise marking was is where the actual bite occurred. So kind of crazy. Yeah. So it sounds like Brad has a win. His chicken plugger stopped working, Ooh. but he oh, figured no. it out. <laughs> oh, that's good. He figured it out. That's good. <laughs> there were lots of. <laughs> he's he's overcoming. Ups and downs happened in there. Yeah. He, he's overcoming. That's awesome. All right. So we're going to uh, keep on going. If you have okay. more wins, let us know. We're going to yeah, keep sure. on going to. Look at the five stories this week, and and y'all guess what was, was the most clicked on and Ooh, least okay. least yeah, clicked through. on story of the week. So we're gonna hide the chat yeah. here real quick. Uh, all right, so Monday, lay off the chicken kissing. This is the CDC always protecting us, always has the best interest, and also always very. Uh, I I almost found to people like. Chickens in your backyard is super, super dangerous. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I don't know. They, they seem to be a, a lot. They, I don't. I think they don't think that people realize that chickens carry diseases, and they put out these stats like, you know, thirty-four hospitalizations and one hundred and sixty-three illnesses in forty-three states. And it's like, are we supposed to think that's a lot? <laughs> I mean, how many people get, you know? The flu every year. How many people yeah, get yeah, yeah. foodborne illness every year? So anyway, okay. uh, that was the CDC checking that out. Um, that was more of a public service announcement, just in case you didn't know that. Yes. That you shouldn't kiss the chicken. You Chickens have salmonella and listeria and all sorts of things. It's so uh, if you are going to kiss them, do so at your own risk. Yeah. Um, second uh, was... An and it isn't pretty has uh had salmonella and it was not fun yeah uh let's think of future us this was a story an article it doesn't have anything particular to homesteading or farming but i thought there, there's a good tie-in with it which is this lady was talking about helping her kids make decisions about just their boots they threw their shoes uh you know wherever when they came in the house from Did winter you send this to justin no, I should. Uh, and and it was basically like their kids threw their shoes out, you know, wherever when they came in from the snow. And then they're all mad when it's time to go and nobody can find their boots. And so that happened. And her, this lady who wrote it and all of her, all of her family were coming in. And she just blurted out, let's think of future us. You know, what should we do now? And what we should do is put our boots away so that we know where they are when we need them. Right. And so the article is just like expanding on that idea. And I thought it was really interesting for the homestead farmer, you know, group. People are trying to do better with their land. Right. It's like every time you make a decision management wise or on your land or what you're going to build, like, let's think of future us. Mm -hmm. And Native Americans actually 
think about this. There's, I think, some mantra they have that they make decisions based on how it'll affect the next seven generations. Wow. So when I'm thinking about making improvements to our farm, I'm starting to think like, let's think of not necessarily how is this going to affect me, but how is this going to affect us when we're older and can't get around as well? How is this going to affect our kids when they decide to take over the farm? How is this going to affect the next owner of the farm if we sell the farm? Yeah. How is this going to affect the land, you know, for the next generation? And so making those management decisions and stuff, I thought, like, that's just the mantra in my head now. Like, let's think of future us, but us not necessarily being you and me, you and me and the family, you and me and the neighborhood, you and me and, you know, whoever lives here yeah. in the future. Sorry about the missing image here. YouTube changed their algorithm or changed their API again. Uh, Greg Judy sitting in a chair in a pasture dropping truth round bombs about sheep. So Ooh. Greg Judy did an awesome Q&A where people from his YouTube channel just asked him questions about sheep. And he just, I mean, he's a straightforward dude. He does not mince words. Yeah. <laughs> I've always, anything I've ever read or watched of Greg Judy, I've always enjoyed. Yeah. So I've seen the, I've seen the results of his sheep breeding firsthand because Justin Rhodes has yeah. his sheep and He's one from the good sheep. Great American Farm Tour that I would love to meet in person. Great like, Judy? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, maybe he's in Missouri. He's only yeah. a day's drive away. Yeah. Uh, Thursday was just kind of another announcement. The Back to Eden Garden folks are having their own summit, and you can take a video of yourself, five minutes or less, in your Back to Eden Garden Ooh. and just announce it, and they'll pick a few to play. So uh, I'm thinking about doing that. Uh, and then the last one, Water, Water Everywhere, is a garden professors. I love the garden professors. Uh, they give you really good, useful tips about gardening. And this one is about how do you know how far the moisture is getting in your soil. And it's, if you don't want to read it, it's very simple. Find a long-handled pokey thing and stick it in the ground. And no matter what kind of soil type you have, as long as there aren't rocks, you can put it in the ground, and once you hit a spot that is dry, it will get much more difficult to to get that into the ground. Sure. And we we actually experience that firsthand. As the pasture dries, it gets much harder to poke like just rocks. a three or four inch yeah. spike from a just three or four inch spike from a uh, fence. a fence, an yeah. electric fence yeah. post. Uh, right after a rain, you could do it with one hand. Yeah. After, you know, a week of a hundred degree ish temperatures, Ugh, we terrible. have to use, we have to use a mallet yeah. to get them in all the way. Yeah. We can't even like push them with our foot. And we have 100% sand, no rocks, no nothing yeah. like that. So this one struck a chord with me as like, yep, that's true. And I also thought it was pretty cool because I got the longest screwdriver I could get and I put it in my back to Eden garden and it was just like, bloop, all the way to the bottom. So I knew. There is plenty of moisture in nice. there, which was cool. Okay, so now we play the game of uh, what is the most. most clicked on and the least clicked on of our. Uh, what were the first two? Scroll down. Of, of our stories. I'll, I'll go through them again mm-hmm. one more time. So I... we have the lay off the chicken kissing, let's think of future us, Greg Judy sitting in a chair in a pasture dropping truth bombs about sheep. Submit a video of your back to Eden Garden and then how to do um, your or how to figure out where your water is. I'm going to say the water, water everywhere Friday is going to be the most clicked on. And then, you know, here's a, something we should look at, too. I wonder if the day of the week has... Any effects? Yeah. Well, with, there is um, one effect, and that is Friday, because that email goes out this morning. Oh. So it has the least amount of time for people to click on it. Oh, okay. Well, I think, I would think that... We should really be talking about last week's story, so there's everyone you know, has, has, a full week. has time to do it. Sure. Well, I think Fridays would get the most clicks. And then, if I were going to pick a number two... I may be wrong about that one because that was so close to the end of the week. I would say Tuesday. 
the let's think of future us that has the least no that has the most i either want either friday or tuesday for the most least hmm i'm gonna actually i think i think monday is gonna be the least the cdc one cdc one is least yeah i don't know i feel like people are getting a little like not as excited about what the CDC has to say about everything. Possibly. I'd just also like to mention to everyone that I found a YouTube video of 10 straight hours of the Jeopardy theme song. This is fantastic. Also, shout out to my mom who has watched Jeopardy like every episode for the last 25 years. Yeah, there you uh, go. I love it. So... <laughs> All right. Least is okay. I'm they're, already getting they're tired. They're guessing. I'm already tired of the Jeopardy Oh, theme most song. is the chicken kissing, and the least is the boots. Tuesday, the let's oh, think of future us. Oh, Kathy, you th you think opposite of me. Yeah. Most is Greg Judy. Um, and least is back to Eden. See, I I think the Greg Judy one is uh very interesting. You should but watch I still, it. But I still... You should watch it. It's like 20 or 25 I, I'm, minutes, I I'm think. I'm going to. Um, There's some good stuff in there. I still think... I don't know. I guess I, I keep going to, like, how many... I guess I don't have any, any like, uh, bearing on how many people that are uh, subscribed to Daily Grower have sheep. And so where that's, like, really applicable to them. Well, I don't know either. And maybe maybe that doesn't even matter. We're just interesting. The show notes here. It has the <laughs> results. Along. <laughs> the, the results of our boy are on the show notes. If you don't notice, these are show notes, right? Here. So uh, did did they see the show notes? Did everyone see? Sometimes it's hard. It takes the computer a little while to see it. Uh, the, the title and thumbs are important as a drop of watching. Yeah, that's true too. Okay, so make sure you check out Daily Grower, folks, to get all these great stories, yeah. as well as come to the live show to let to have Karen, you know, decide or guess along with everyone what the top one is. I am yeah. totally blown out, blown away at the results this week. Good. It was so people must be really hot. And checking their email more because there was double as many clicks on oh. this one story as any other story ever okay. in, its first, in its first week. Okay. And which one was it? The first week story that was the most was, drum roll, or, or maybe Jeopardy theme song. Don't do that. That's too much. That's too much noise on oh, there. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, we got to end it. Oh, see, it sure. loops. It loops for ten hours, so it never. You never actually get the timpani yeah, drum at the end. All right, all right, enough. Yeah, enough. Let's hear it. Survey says no. That's wrong. Game show. <laughs> Top story. Top story. Water, water everywhere. Fridays. I was right. That's. I mean, it's only been out there for sixteen hours. That's so awesome. But everybody wants to know about if they're. Water, especially with the heat. With the heat. Yeah. See, I'm telling you. The bottom it was story. A, it was applicable. Yes. And who said, what did you say for the bottom story, Karen? Um, I think the the, the layoff sheep the one? chicken kissing. No, no, no. The layoff the chicken I kissing? I think the chicken kissing is going to be the bottom one. Mm, okay. Am I, am I right or wrong? You are actually correct on both. I got week. both right this week. Congratulations. Yes. I don't think people like, I don't think homesteader types like the federal government talking down to them about their animals. They do not. <laughs> I don't. I'm like, whatever. First leave me of alone. all, leave me alone. Yeah. Second of all, I already have had my own experience about kissing chickens and have learned my lesson. So <laughs> I don't need to read your article. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Kathy, but it is on record. You thought chicken kissing was number one and it was in fact yeah not so sorry well, about that i think sometimes too i mean 
it's like when you have something where you're like, oh, I probably know what they're already going to say. So I don't have to click on it and spend the time reading it. And I feel like that one is pretty, like you can imagine pretty well what the CDC is going to say about also chickens. some more stats. Another thing that Karen mentioned. So you mentioned you weren't sure how many people were interested in sheep. Yeah. That are part of the daily grower yes. subscribers. Yes. There was actually, and I, again, blown out of the water. The, the, it was blown out of the water. The, the water the second one. Most? The second most was Greg Juby. Okay. And that doesn't surprise me because I think that that even if you don't have sheep, that still would be fascinating. And Greg Judy is a pretty fascinating guy. Yeah. He he doesn't mince words, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So there there actually was, you know, not as many as Fridays, obviously, but the Greg Judy one had an insane amount of clicks on it. Okay. Compared to a normal week. Okay. So people wanted to know, you what, know what Greg had to say. Hitting their summer stride, they've got time. They're interested. Oh yeah, the garden's all things. planted. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's that's school's true. coming out. Yeah. Well, no, I don't know. That means they got to figure out what to do with the kids. They sit them down in front of the Greg Judy videos. That's what you, they should do. Uh, so if you're interested in that Greg Judy video, go ahead and take a look at Daily Grower. Also, when you're on his channel, he did the exact same thing which I missed, he did a big Q&A about uh, grass-fed beef as well. Oh. So if you want to know more about cows, he did the Q&A for that as well. And what's funny is that he was just sitting in a chair in a pasture and his wife was filming him with cows just grazing behind him. And then he did the same Q&A in the same thing in that same pasture with the cows grazing behind him, but just answering questions about sheep so the whole time he's answering all these questions about sheep there's like 25 cows in the background yeah and one of them came over and was like sniffing the chair like hey what's going on here <laughs> he doesn't strike me as somebody who would want to take the time to like go get set up in a studio it's like no. i've got stuff to do on the farm if you want to ask me some questions and have me answer them you can do that where I'm all where I already am, yeah. and that's out here in yeah. the pasture. I really so, appreciate that yeah. about him and Joel Salton, and basically any farmer I know that is just very good at what they do. Yeah. Gabe, Gabe Brown, same. They don't do things that don't matter. Yeah, they do not waste time on things that do not yeah. matter. Yeah, uh, they do not waste time on things that do not achieve the goals that they're trying to do. So, right. Um, Kudos to Greg for releasing a video every single day, uh, every weekday at least. Um, and you know they're not they're not like highly produced or anything like that. They're just him out there talking about what he's doing. And when someone's that successful and talking about what he's doing, then that means that there's a lot of education to be had. So Kathy says, I can't believe how many people had so much of a problem with the CDC reminding people to wash their hands after handling an animal that poops at its own feet and walks around. <laughs> well, see, here's the thing. It's just good common sense. Like, and so. Um, but people get real snuggly with animals, you know. They They're do. They're snuggly with dogs and they cats. Do. Why not be snuggly with the chicken? There are people who have chicken house chickens. Not house work. rabbits, house ferrets, yeah. house, house everything. I know. Not us. Once we bought a farm, we swore off all the animals in the house. I love my animals outside. We've had plenty of them in the house for They're various reasons. They're happy outside, they, they and live. I'm happy with them outside. They all live outside. Everybody's happy. Outside. Everyone's outside. <laughs> all right. So thanks, everyone, for playing along. We love yeah. doing that. Uh, subscribe and contribute at dailygrower.com. Also, uh, if you have a question, you want us to do a live show about it, dailygrower.com slash voicemail. Leave a, leave a voicemail. Just hit the recording button. You see it's in this orange section down here on the bottom right. There is a question, and it doesn't have to be a question that we do on the live show. It could just be a question that you have, and if you don't want us to talk about it on the live show, obviously we would honor that but yes, uh for sure. if it's something that you know could be useful for uh, a crowd of folks and i was going back and looking and 
most of our live streams are getting between 100 and 250 views. So oh, sweet. that's pretty cool. People are actually sitting through and watching them. Very good. If you look at the YouTube analytics, most people are watching over half of the live stream. Awesome. So. Well, we better get to the topic. Yeah, okay, so to the topic. We're going to lose them. <laughs> yeah, we're an hour in already, okay. So <laughs> people are going to be like, how long can these people talk about weather? About the weather. <laughs> because it's new and exciting every single week. That's why. Every day. Um, all right, so okay, Karen, and I, Karen and I were talking earlier today about just achieving a balance. And yes. this is a constant topic at my workplace of achieving, maintaining uh, a balanced work and balanced life. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it's really easy for us to talk about that in a corporate sense, if you're in the corporate world. Well, because you have nine to five. Yeah. So you, right there, you already have a limited, like a limiting factor of the hour, the, the work day is set. Yeah. And, and achieving that work-life balance means you have to have the ability to sometimes step away during business hours to yeah. deal with, you know, medical issues or take vacation time, stuff like that, and just recharge. And actually, I'm, I'm dealing with that today. I had today off, and it was a company-wide day off called Wellness Friday, and it's something cool that they did, and I'm super excited about it because I'm... They're going to do it a couple times this summer, and I have things planned for almost every every one of those days. I went fishing this morning, and that helps my wellness uh, a lot. So it does. Um, but you we, were happier all day, was I? Yeah. Oh well, I got a nap too. So yeah, that helps. Wellness too. Fridays <laughs> or the naps are are necessary. But you know, we got to talking today, you and I, about your farm and your homestead, sometimes it can be your job if you're a full-time farmer or part-time yeah. farmer. Sometimes it's just your, you know, things that you do, improvement of your property, and it can get overwhelming really fast. Yeah, and for sure. And you don't talk about it in the same sense of work-life balance because it's your home. Yeah. And so... Well, and like, it never quit. Th this should be what you're doing to relax, right? And like, how come it's making me so stressed? <laughs> So I also had a meeting this morning with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, NRCS, that's the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and we're going to be doing a grant project this summer to put in pasture water lines. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I've been kind of dreading doing that for... I feel like it's going to be a game changer for us. Yeah, for a year or two, because it's just like, oh, it's just another thing to do. And they told me in 2020, like, you have to get this done like you're under contract to finish it. And I was like, pandemic, no. <laughs> and, and that was good because it gave me the opportunity to think a whole year in advance about what am I going to change so that this project doesn't become a major burden uh -huh. of just another thing being piled on. And talking with them this morning and looking over the plan that they gave us of, of how to put the water lines in and everything, I, I just kind of thought, this is going to be awesome. Yeah. We'll have water in every pasture accessible within 100 feet, and we'll just drag a one 100-foot one hose around that will be able to just flip a switch, turn the water on, and, you know, what takes sometimes... 15 to 20 minutes with watering of fetching water and bringing it out oh on the ATV should take two to three minutes now. Well, and with having more sheep, that process is getting more and more onerous, more and more time. And then what we have right now is like a water, a 35 gallon water tank thing that we have a hose. And so you fill up the tank and then you take the tank to fill up like the water troughs yeah. and with as many ewes and lambs that, as we had this year, which is the most we've had. So now we're using, and we've previously we've used like a couple, uh, five gallon, like bucket tub things. Yeah. Those rubber, yeah. rubber pans. Yeah. And I could fill those up twice a day and keep, the group of like ewes and lambs watered. Well, those were, so we had two five gallon uh, buckets back when they were like just getting onto pasture a little bit 
um, when the lambs were newborn, I was filling those up three and getting to be four times a day. Yeah. So they were going, well, they were still eating mostly hay. They were easily going um, through, what, 30, no. Yeah, 30 gallons of water a day. Um, and sometimes a little bit more than that. Yeah. So, and now we've got a big, we've got the big like metal watering trough out there. I think, I think it's like 55 or 60 gallons or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, they can almost drink that in, in a day and a half to two days. But the thing is with the heat is that it's been getting so green with it gets algae warm, it gets warm and it gets yeah. algae very quickly. yeah so then it has to be dumped and cleaned and everything yeah. like that so yeah those water lines will totally <clears throat> change and just make the whole process of caring for the sheep and everything so much easier yeah, yeah. so i think part of like you know bringing it back to this balance thing is like making strategic decisions for what's going to make your life more balanced, right? So yeah. right now we have a major imbalance when it comes to maintaining rotationally grazing with the sheep. Mm -hmm. And we have already decided that that's the only way that we're going to manage our land and our sheep. So we have to figure out how to do that in an efficient way. And the flock is getting bigger. Yeah. It takes more fences. It takes more manpower. Yeah. Um, and so one of the decisions that I made was, is that I was not going to grow chickens this year. And it just so happened that Maddie, our daughter was willing to step up and manage the poultry yeah. for this year. And so that has already freed up. It's freed up a lot of time to do stuff like, <laughs> like this, yeah, uh, which has been really fun because we get to hang out with you guys. Um, but it also, you know, we decided to put all of our poultry production in before basically the middle of June, yeah. which means that now there's going to be some breathing room to do that project. And once that project is done, that's going to decrease the amount of time that you're working outside on yeah. sheep yeah. doing one of the more difficult tasks. It's a pretty physical task, hauling water around, mm -hmm. um, you know, to reduce the amount of time that it takes you to do things by 10, 20, maybe even sometimes over half an hour a day in oh, really, I would say really hot times. Easily right? because that water tank even with being able to take out, if we've got that water tank on the big trailer, then I can fill it up. But even with being able to take out 35 gallons out to the pasture at a time, it takes easily a half an hour for that thing to drain. Yeah. And yeah. So, and it probably takes the current system we have. It right probably now takes slow 10 ish minutes for it to fill up from the hose. Yeah. Like the hose water runs quick enough that it fills up fairly quickly, but, um, but draining out because it's just gravity, it just is slow. Yeah. Unless you get it just right. Like, cause you got it. I found like, okay, if I get it just right and then I keep the hose level. So from where it's coming out of the thing and the, it doesn't dip down and then go back up to go into the thing, then it'll drain quicker but that's like holding the hose and swatting mosquitoes at the same time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like such a deal yeah and this is the part of the <laughs> this is the time of year when the gnats oh. start getting bad and the mosquitoes are coming out so you want to be out there even less the other night i was just like it was bad yeah i wanted to come in and i needed to get their thing full and it was like the bugs were coming out yeah so i mean bringing that all in part of that balance then is like figuring out how to just be more efficient with yeah. your time and we're really lucky, is. we're lucky here because since we decided to incorporate as a farm and not just a homestead that opens up some possibilities for grants and everything and since we're new farmers the government you know, the USDA is going to pay for basically 80% of that project. Yeah. Which is awesome. Uh, which is super cool. And I mean, I don't think we could really do it. It if... would be, I mean, the whole project in itself, I'm going to add a bunch of stuff to it that they didn't put into their plan just because I want it to be easier, you know, more, yeah. more places to hook into the water. I mean, it's going to be three or $4,000 to yeah. do all that. Well, 
Yeah. That's what they said it would be. I don't know if they've kept up with prices of things. If, <laughs> if these materials yeah, are cause... more expensive now than they were, you know, a year ago, who knows? Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's just, that's just one thing. Like you're trading your money for, for time. And that's a trade that looks good for us because we're trading 20% of our money for time. Yeah. And that's really nice. So, you know, that's the first thing about maintaining that, maintaining that balance is, you know, even just what we were talking about with Greg Judy, like we don't do things that don't matter. Yeah. <laughs> and so I guess the, the sense of that is prioritize, right? Yeah. And then, sure. you know, when things you have that do matter, if you need to strike a balance, then find out the best way and most efficient way to go about doing that. Yeah. And then invest your time and money and resources into doing that. And, you know, it's difficult because sometimes you, you don't know what that is right away. Right. Yeah. I mean, sure. we, we probably wouldn't, we, we almost do our grazing a little different every single year because the flock keeps growing Yeah, and the well, pastures are different every year. Yes. Depending on what the weather's doing and whatever. I mean, we have some pastures that are pretty consistently better than others, but, um, like the pasture that the sheep were just in, like in the last week or so is I feel like is probably one of our worst pastures and previous years they've almost skipped it yeah. or, or have skipped most of it because there just wasn't anything for them to eat there. Mm -hmm. But then you've been running the chickens and the turkeys through there. So we were able to get a good pass of the sheep through it this year, which I think will really benefit it. And also in the future, uh, I took some pictures in the back pasture this, this afternoon. Yeah. And winter bale grazing is huge. We have super huge sections of our back pasture that is like, you can look down and it's like, here's a blade of grass, here's a blade of grass. And there's six inches in between them. I mean, it's just that bad. And then you go and look at the places where we were feeding the sheep their yeah. hay and it is lush and green and up to my waist. Yeah. And, and just two feet over it's super sparse. Yeah. And that's the difference between, you know, putting a cover on the soil yeah. that spent hay, that waste hay covers the soil, which keeps it from evaporating, keeps, keeps, you know, the moisture. soil moist. Yeah. And that allows bacteria to start doing their thing, which helps plants grow. And then you're reseeding it with the waste hay. And also the animals were there and they urinated and manured on it. And yeah. so it's fertilized. And so it's like, that is one of those like 10 X, they call them force multipliers mm -hmm. in, in my field where it's just like you do this one thing and you get benefits across the board. Yeah. So that's like a practice that we'll continue doing. And I think we should greatly expand that too, like to the amount of space that we do it. Cause well, we didn't do it in a huge amount of we space. We either have to put in more permanent fencing to do that, or we have to get more, of the premier netted fencing right. because the Gallagher's, which I love, we gonna, cannot use them in the winter time. We're not going to stand up in the winter. No. So, uh, Brad brings up a great point, which is exactly one of the things I was going to bring up tonight was don't do things that, you know, don't, that are a waste of your time. Yeah. Is don't sell eggs. <laughs> Many yep. people find out this the hard way. And some people actually never learn this, uh, that, eggs is something that people want to get into. And then when they realize how much work it is, it's not that much work to add 10 chickens and collect eggs, but it is a lot of work to sell them and clean them. Yeah. And, uh, the margins are so thin already that once you work in your free labor to it, it's hard. And you constantly have people that are undercutting your price. Yeah. Uh, so you have to be able to have a lot of eggs, a big market for them and an efficient way to clean them in America. And, yeah. um, and that, that's how you can make eggs, but typically eggs are lost leaders yeah. in, and they're a way to get you in, to get customers in, to buy your other stuff. Um, well, and so that I, was, that was something that we learned too. We decided yeah. we're not going to do this anymore because we didn't produce enough eggs 
to satisfy the need that we want. We didn't want to invest more into it because we just didn't, it just wasn't going to be our thing. And we did not want to wash eggs because it was super time consuming. Well, and we didn't want to invest in what Brad was talking about, the egg cleaner. The other thing is too, for us is like, we order our chicks, we raise the meat, raise the animals through the summer. And then we have like a pickup day where people come one time or maybe two times to get their meat. Mm -hmm. Well, the amount of eggs that we're going to have available on those one or two days, like, yeah, probably any one of those people would take a dozen eggs with whatever else they're buying, but they're not going to, most of them aren't necessarily close enough by, or it isn't convenient enough for them that they're going to come every week and get their like week's supply of eggs. Um, I mean, we've had a number of customers over the years when we were doing eggs that it was like, oh, I'd love to get eggs or I'd love to, you know, buy them regularly or whatever. And what that actually realistically worked out to be was every few months they'd message and be like, hey, you can, I, eggs? can I, yeah, can I get a, a you know, a few dozen right now? Cause it's Easter next week or whatever. Like they would want to come once and get as many as they could, but like you have to either have a really big laying flock to sustain that. And then what are you going to do with all those eggs in between the times when people come and get a, like you, you'd have to have a really yeah. big regular customer base and the whole rest of our farm business isn't functioning in that same timeline no, so it just doesn't basis. it didn't make sense for us like people want the eggs when they're here but and then then you can't i mean it's like things can happen with the weather and the chickens quit laying or the molting or the whatever there's like all these so then you have to have different ages of laying hens to keep the production going it's just like such a larger system than anything we can reasonably maintain yeah and think of it as the difference between someone I mean, that gets a couple of feeder pigs and sells them in the fall right versus someone that has year-round like well like we have sheep too yeah and but we don't even produce we don't have enough sheep even to be able to produce lamb meat year-round right no and we don't keep i mean we we were we don't have a breed that that we're gonna breed multiple times a year and have lambs that we're butchering multiple times a year. It's like we're lambing in the spring, we're butchering in the fall. We've got a select group of animals that we're carrying over the winter and then we do it again. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's partially for our balance for our own time, but then also partially because it's like, we do only have so much like pasture to work with. So we are, we can't just grow and grow and grow until we're like, oh, you know, yay, we have hundreds of animals. Like we can't have hundreds of animals on the land that we have doing what we're doing. Yeah. So, and we don't want to. Yeah. I mean, I, I've i had people ask me so <laughs> many times, like, well, how, how big will you let your flock grow? And I'm like, I don't know. We'll see. The, and, the land is what decides that. Right. But well, and, and like our ability to take care of it. Right. But like, even if we got the pastures to the point where we could really maximize the ability, how, how many animals we could have on it, I'm still like, I don't know, how many would we want to have? I mean, there's so many other factors. It's like, okay, well, if we were going to maximize it, well, then we'd also have to do this and this and this with fencing because to have that many animals and to be able to have the time to rotationally graze and manage them the way that we want to, we have to have more permanent fencing. Like we couldn't do what we're doing now with three times as many sheep. Like I, it would be craziness. Yeah. 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 So Brad, makes a good point that eggs can be good in uh, emergency preparedness situations. Oh, and that's honestly, that's one of the reasons why we still keep a layer block for ourselves yeah. is that we have some amount of built-in ability to produce food for ourselves for not 
terribly long, but long enough, I think. Yeah. <laughs> long enough that I would probably, if it was that kind of zombie apocalypse situation, I would probably hide some of our animals <laughs> in a barn so that no one else decided that they were hungry yeah. and wanted them. But, uh, you know, also that that isn't really at the forefront of our minds as much as like, I see like our lane hens as ecological service animals, you know, yeah. they're currently the prep, prep, they're currently prepping the next section of my vegetable garden right now. And I'm not doing that work. Like they're doing that and they're going to do it all summer. And then I build, I build new garden space in the fall. And so by the time fall comes around, they're ready. They've already produced and, you know, destroyed an area yeah. of turf that, that we do that. And the same thing with meat chickens and pol and turkeys. I love them, but you know, we love to eat them and we like growing and raising them. Well, yeah. I mean, I like growing turkeys more, but they're there right now to fertilize pasture so yeah. that I don't have to buy fertilizer Yeah, and we get to eat out of it. Yeah. Um, which is nice too. Yeah. So I think that's part of the, you know, the, the work part, the work side of the work life balance is, Really, and we've talked about this at pre on previous live streams, is like, how do you decide what it is you're going to grow? And you need you need it to check all the boxes of something that you like to do, something that has a market if you're going to sell it, yeah, uh, something that you like to eat. You know, how do you decide what to grow in your garden? Well, you grow the stuff that's appropriate for your climate that you're actually going to eat. You know, yeah, and and you have that checklist of things to determine what it is you're going to do and what's appropriate for your land. And I mean, like pigs, not appropriate for our land and sheep. Great for our, for our land. I do love me some bacon though. Yeah. So we buy bacon from a farmer because, yeah. because he does have a setup for pigs and we yeah. don't. Yeah. Um, but Brad is right on. Like you, you think of this from a systems approach where how do I maintain or sustain or regenerate my land as best as I can. And even if that's, even if that's a container garden on your deck, you know, how, how do you go about doing that where you can still get some joy out of it? Yeah. And, and it doesn't become, you know, craziness, just absolute craziness. Yeah. And, and part of why I talk about this is just like, soul searching i think that we've done in the past about things like eggs but now also this year about you know i'm having and i'm really struggling about do we want to continue growing chickens or do it every year like maybe we don't maybe we need to skip a year or two to do it just to get some other things done that make it so that i really <laughs> I really don't like that, you know, and it makes me crabby every time I see it, you know, but I can't get it done because I got chickens, I got turkeys, I got gardens, I got yeah. sheep, I got all yeah. this other stuff. And I mean, I'm seriously having those kinds of considerations of like, well, yeah, we'll lose some customers and we'll lose the money that we make from chickens. But it's, it's, it's kind of like this Marie Kondo look at things of like, does growing chickens spark joy, right? You know, <laughs> in comparison to making the updates to our shop that will get things cleaned out and yeah. make it a more usable space. Yeah. Right. Like skipping chickens for a times to make that a much more usable space would be like, again, that would be uh, a total win for us. Right? Yeah. And so that's kind of the things that I'm going through right now. Um, Alyssa says, work-life balance takes on a whole new meaning when you have young kids. You think you'll surely have time next year for XYZ, and you never have time. And you know what? Yeah. I would take what you say and scratch out young because it's just we're learning. Kids become much more independent, but they also, I don't feel like they are less time-consuming. No. Not they're they're more time consuming when they're young because they're with you and you and they depend on you, but now they're like not with you as much, but they still depend on you. It just shifts because it's like now they need a ride to cross country practice. Yeah, when they're little, <laughs> they need you to do everything, and then once you have them to be a little bit self sufficient, you still have to watch them or keep track of them so that they don't do something stupid while you're trying to do something else. Yeah. And then 
when they're just out of that phase, they get to where they can help a little bit, but it takes more time to teach them how to do what they can do to help you than it does to actually do it yourself. Yeah. So it's that's like a really, really hard part. It, that's my heart most. Like, I'm not good at it. I'm like, oh, just here. Ugh. Like, if they'll just, if everybody will just go away, I can do this. And like, a quarter of the time. Yeah. Um, and then once they're like really proficient at being helpful, sometimes it's like, okay, now we got to deal with like, do they have a good attitude and actually want to be helpful? So we're like training on that, which takes time. And then if you have kids who want to be helpful and they're capable and you've already put in the time to train them, well, by that point they're driving and now they've left you. <laughs> now they've got a bunch <laughs> like, of friends it's like, and they want to go hang out with those friends on Friday. Night. Oh gosh. Um, and so, yeah, it is. It, it, I, I don't know that it necessarily gets better as it gets older, as they get older. It's just different. Um, that's true. And, and I mean, we're getting to the point where we don't really remember having small, small children. It's not our day to day anymore. Yeah. But I mean, like, you know, one year olds don't necessarily have a baseball tournament, you know, three, yeah. three weekends in June. And you're like, where did the summer go? Well, yeah. How come I didn't yeah. get any projects done? Yeah. I, you're, you're sitting next at a baseball field, which honestly we love. It's a lot yeah, of fun. But yeah. when you have a farm, and most of the people on the baseball team don't have a farm, no, they there don't. are things that you still have to do. Yeah, and it's like, oh, it's not too big of a deal to be at the at the at the field by nine o'clock, and the field's an hour away. Well, yeah, you got to feed all the animals and then go to the field. So yeah, but I will say about the diaper stage, we had like a little like like family or like husband wife high five. When Elsa, our youngest, was potty trained, it was like, "That's it." Well, and look at how much money we just found in the monthly budget because we're not buying diapers or we're not washing diapers. Yeah, well, because we did cloth diapers with her, but no, you know the other thing was too. But the, when diapers you remember, end, you're like, "Oh my gosh!" When we go on vacation, look how much more room we have in the car. We had so Maddie and Grace are 18 months apart. So, but then there's what a little over four years between grace and jack our second and our third. yeah so when we decided to have jack gracie was was fully out of diapers and we were like are we really gonna do this <laughs> i mean i don't know maybe two is a good i mean and now we're we love jack yeah. and then a jack too he was was he was out of diapers when was when uh, Elsa was born. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, so that's we, actually happened to us three times. We restarted. We, back in we are all done. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, no animals. Now we have baby animals, and I tell you what, bottle feeding those lambs this year. I was like, I said I was done with this. Like these things have to figure out how to eat from their mothers or feed themselves. I mean, I, this is I, this is not what I signed up for. Karen looked at me when we had bottle lambs, and I was like, "We're not actually going to do this, are you?" Or <laughs> that's true. You're not actually going to do this, are you? Because we're done with kids. Yeah. Like no more changing diapers. No more. None of that stuff. And and I was like, and, "Oh, I just I just got to get them going. Then they'll be fine." And I I would like to. I would like to say right now that I was like, oh, no, this is not going to be fine. I tell you what, though, I learned a good lesson. Hold on. Hold on. I just want to show okay, people wait. this real quick. What? <laughs> that was me trying to get a diaper on a bottle lamb in our house when someone left me home with them. <laughs> you said you were willing. Oh, yeah. I was willing. <laughs> But oh my goodness. I never, ever, ever thought I would be doing that. No. Putting diapers on an animal running through, a farm animal running through my mm -hmm. house. It was fun <laughs> for like two days. Yeah. <laughs> I saw, I saw it coming. I was like, this is going to end in heartache, <laughs> tears, gnashing and weeping, <laughs> gnashing of teeth. <laughs> I was so tired. <laughs> so the thing is, that is, that was a big win. Her win of the week was big this week because they are fully weaned now. Yes. 
No more walking into the pasture after dark to bring them milk. Right. So hopefully they fully transition. Like they, I don't have any other like steps back yeah. with them. So it's definitely really important. Yeah. Hey, Justin Rhodes is here. Hey, Justin. Hey, how you doing, bud? Um, classical spousal balance. Love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, that's one thing that's really exciting for for us is that we have really figured out a lot of this work balance on our farm. Yeah. Of like dealing with the overwhelm, dealing with, you know, that sort of like, we have to do everything. We have to have sheep. We have to have layers. We have to have meat chickens. We got to do all this stuff and really coalescing down into the stuff that is just ours. Well, you're better and, at and, that than I am love. too. Cause I always want to like add more things. Yeah. And I, then, and then there's, then it's too much. And I'm like, ah, well, it's too much. It's too much. That's just a, I think that's just a trait of homesteaders and farmers, because when you think about it, you want to produce your own food. We are omnivores, right? Yeah. Well, except Justin, he's, he's, uh, I don't, I think he's off of the carnivore thing. Oh, is too. he? Has but he added some veggies back in? I think so. I saw, I thought I saw him eating a potato this oh. week. Um, big steps. But I mean, that means that you're growing fruit. Everyone yeah. wants an orchard. You're growing veggies. Everyone's got a garden. You're growing red meat. You're growing white meat. You're growing yeah. the other white meat. And, and it's just, it's just too much. And I have taken a lot of people that email me and like, oh, I want to do all these things. And I always just tell them to slow down and pick one. Yeah. And do that. Yeah. Like, it's okay. You probably have 30 to 70 growing seasons left in your life. Yeah, yeah. Take one or two, unless you're going to grow trees, plant trees right away. This right? is ninety five percent meat, no potatoes. I thought I saw you holding a big potato this this week, for some reason. Far North Alaska, Far North Life. Hello from Alaska. Yeah, oh, hello, hello. Hey, you can talk to Kathy Go. She's heading to Alaska here pretty soon. Yeah. To work on the boat. That's pretty cool. Very cool. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the work balance sort of thing, and and you know we're. We're, we're talking today about some of that life balance too, right? Of like, I have a lot of things that like I do. I'm always busy. I always have multiple things to do. I was just yeah. thinking about college. When I was in college, I was a physics major. I was, you know, maintaining a long distance relationship with my girlfriend. <laughs> it was not long distance. It was, it was like 20 miles was or 20, something. <laughs> 20 miles, but I was on campus. You weren't. Um, True. And, and, you know, I also was a TA for a Bible professor, a math professor, a physics professor. Yeah. I had an internship in downtown Minneapolis and I delivered pizzas on Friday and Saturday nights. Yeah. And I played guitar at church on Sunday mornings. And it's just too much. <laughs> yeah. It's just way too much. Yeah. And, and I realized that once we got into farming, got on this property, I got daily grower going even, and... I am, you know, doing other work for other people, some consulting stuff. And I just realized I was back into that stage of life that really did not serve me well yeah. he health wise. Yeah. I got a lot done, but, and then we have this discussion that we see our oldest daughter, Maddie was in the same, she's like in the same boat. She's yeah. like, she's like mini me at 16 years old and today she took her AP bio exam, which was yeah. a stressful thing. Yeah. And afterwards we were like, just go out with your friends. They're at, they're at the school play tonight. Just go party. It's the end of the school year. Yeah. And, but you know, she's looking at a summer job. She's got this AP test. She's, she's managing all the poultry. She's managing all the chickens. She is a prolific writer and has her like little writing group of friends on Zoom that they do. And we can just kind of see it coming out of her. We're like, we really need to model that balance better. Yeah. Because our kids, they eventually turn into you. I don't know if you noticed this, but you turn into your parents <laughs> in many ways, good and bad. It's true. And, you know, we need to be able to model the ability for her to just chill out and spend time with friends, spend yeah. times with, with family and everything. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that's really important that we do that. So I'm, I'm starting to think of different decisions and, you know, the first thing I guess I'll 
say it here is like there's not going to be a live stream. <clears throat> there's not going to be a live stream next Friday because our family is yes. getting together. Yep. And that's not necessarily like anything other than we have family that's in America that lives in Berlin and they're only going to be here for another six weeks. Yeah. And so like we're going to spend every amount, every waking amount of time that we can with them. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the daily grower live stream is just going to have to take a back seat for that. You know, last week it took a back seat cause I was sick, Yeah. <laughs> which I think is normal, but I didn't want to do that. I was really bummed. Yeah. Especially cause I started feeling better on, Friday evening. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, maybe I should do it. We try to do them every Friday night for our North Life, but um we if things if we have things come up that are higher on the list, like a family gathering, then um then we skip it. Yeah. So we've talked about having like something in place, but we haven't gotten that set up. We've talked about posting like a pre recorded class or something and we just haven't quite gotten that done yet yeah and there it is again it's uh you know there's a lot of stuff that we want to do or i think we're going to work on a beginner's sheep class yes an online course yeah and uh you know i'm gonna i'm gonna take a little bit of time away from daily grower to uh now that i've had it up for six or so months you know i'm going to change some things about it are you and so that means that the live stream is probably going to, I want to integrate the live stream with the website a lot more than yeah. it is right now. Yeah. And I, you know, I built it all from scratch and there's some things that I, I need to just kick back and say, let some other software do that. You don't need to write your own software for that. So, um, yeah. So, you know, that's the, for those of you on, thank you for, for being on. And we like to do this every every Friday, but yeah, over the summer, we're going to, we're going to do it less. Yeah. And I know the summer is basically already started. Yeah. Um, but well, we're going to be, you always post if we're going to have one or if we're not. Yeah. So, and, yeah. and let's like, yeah. And, and just know like when we're not doing live stream, it's because we have, we're like actively trying to keep a good balance between yeah. our family and our our farm and our life yeah. and our work and those sorts of things. So it's challenging. It's it, so challenging. Yeah. And so you kind of just think about what's important. Like your family is super important, right? And yeah. spending time with them is our kids when we're doing this, uh <laughs> you know, they're watching TV right now. That's we have them clean and we have them get ready for this and they have their movie night tonight Yeah. so that we can do this. And, you know, we're going to have movie nights with them and we're going to go do fun stuff on Friday nights. Like Karen rented a boat and we're all going out on the boat. We're going on the boat. Yeah. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. So, yeah. um, and then, you know, like just thinking about business and those sorts of things, you know, we have made strategic decisions about what we're going to do with our farm and we're kind of already, when you're in the thick of it, it's a good time to think like, hey, this is when it's stressful. This is when everything's going on. Yeah. What are the things that are, you know, that you want to work on to be most changing for next year? Because yeah. one thing I love about farming is how cyclical it is, right? Yeah. It's like you always go back and and spring is spring, you know, summer is summer. Yeah. And the, the animals in nature, they that's their schedule. And so you're on it. Yeah. You know, you can't when you try and sort of shift it off of that schedule, that's when, you know, usually when you start having problems trying to grow chicken in Minnesota in the yeah. middle of winter, tomatoes in the middle of winter, it's like doesn't doesn't necessarily come out. Well, one well. thing we had happen just this last week is we had somebody kind of contact us out of the blue looking for breeding stock of sheep, which we I wouldn't say I've ever felt opposed to selling breeding stock, but I just didn't feel like we were like we had arrived yet to do that. <laughs> like I felt like that was like a there's like a certain point and I wasn't quite sure when that point was, but at the point that we were at, I felt like, oh no, we've just got this small flock and we've got, you know, um single digits of lambs each year and so 
we're, we're keeping this many for ourselves and we're selling this many, uh, all keeping some for ourselves as meat, keeping some for ourselves to grow our flock and then selling a few for meat. And so I just never felt like we could do that. Well, we had somebody contact us that was looking for some breeding stock. And I was like, you know, I actually, we actually had a really nice, good looking group of ewe lambs this year. And we weren't going to keep them all for ourselves, for our flock. I had a few that I had already picked out that I was going to keep um, in our flock and retain. And then the other ones, I was just planning on raising them for meat and selling the meat while well, we had this guy contact us and um, wanted to come and, and get some lambs and use them for breeding stock and take them home and raise them. You know, they were ready. They were at a point where they could be weaned. Uh, we always leave them with their mothers. But anyways, it worked out and it was kind of crazy because I was like, okay, do I know what I'm doing? Whatever. And they came and got the lambs and took them away. And I had this little bit of like, oh, that's three less sheep that are out on that pasture. Like, it's just, our pasture has been so like, just we've got to move, got to move, got to move this year because it was dry and then it rained and then now it's dry and so hot and everything like that. And I'm like, you know, maybe that's a thing. Maybe, maybe we're going to get, we'll, you know, see about selling more of them as lambs or breeding stock, or I don't know if somebody else wants to like grow them out or whatever. Yeah. And we just won't have as many to move all summer long. And maybe that'll be a thing, a way to like keep it more balanced. Cause I've been feeling like, Oh, we got to grow the flock. I grow the flock. And this year I was kind of like, I don't know. It just felt a little, I, I obviously think about crazy. the economics immediately. And I thought, look at how much money we just made and we don't have to keep those sheep for four more months Yeah, and sell them to someone and take them to the butcher and bring them back and set up a time to, for them to come and get them and yeah. yada, yada, yada. And I mean, the profitability of that move right there was very high yeah. in comparison to selling them yeah. as food to a, to a, uh, you know, to directly to a customer that's going to eat them. Yeah. Uh, let's catch up on the chat here real quick. Okay. Far North Life, you're only a year into this. You know what you should do? You should go to dailygrower.com slash subscribe <laughs> and get homesteading and farming story and growth stories in your email box once a day or once a week. Um, and yeah, we actually are going to take offline time. That's one thing we're going to do this week uh, or we're going to start, I think next week is we're just going to shut the Wi-Fi off and the kids and us will be forced to be together <laughs> and we have a pool so we spend a lot of time together yeah in the it's summer not, i mean but honestly we're, but no we're, we're 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 teaching them that there's a time for devices there's yeah a time for yeah, being with friends for sure and there's a time to not be that because otherwise on hot days 100 degrees what else are you gonna do yeah i mean you can't sit out in the sun all day you get sunburned <laughs> yeah uh, and then Kathy, you have a friend in Southern California that's so amazing. Can't comprehend that our lives and schedules here in Minnesota are dictated by the weather. You know, as far as I know, California's lives are dictated by the weather only when there's like wildfire type situations, yeah, yeah. but I don't know. My dad's from there. Maybe he can pipe in, uh, Maureen, we definitely, I definitely would love to do more daily grower shows live shows outside because i bought the equipment to do it and we did them in the barn when we had lambs but it's hard to do them outside and it's going to be harder in july because there'll be mosquitoes everywhere yeah um but maybe august would be great when the sun is still up late enough in the evening um because i i love doing it outside i thought it was so fun yeah the only thing was is i started getting cold and i started pacing <laughs> and one of my uh wife's uh former neighbors had to tell me to stop because she was <laughs> she was getting nauseous or yeah, something yeah <laughs> would we ever sell feeders rather than raising them all the way we basically just did that but we yeah. sold them as breeding stock to right. another farmer and honestly i think we probably could get more money for them 
as breeding stock than as feeders. Yeah. We got probably double the money by selling them as breeding stock. Mm -hmm. And he was, I, he was pretty hot to get them though. He was. And we you all, know, some he, of it too, it's like, as breed is you, kind of in demand. You learn right? as you go and you're like, I probably could have sold those for more. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like it's, it's hard to like, as I'm, I learn as I go and I, I don't want to like, just like, Oh, let's, you just know, make people. sure ever. Yeah. Like, but at the same time, it's like learning the value of what you have. Um, and so sometimes you go and you do things and I look at the sheep and I go, okay, well, if I actually went back and like Real calculated, quick. yeah. Thank, thanks for showing up, Kathy. Thanks yeah. for moderating. And, uh, to thank answer your you question, can. I'm the one that plays the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, you know, if I were to go back and actually calculate like how much time I put into those lambs before they were sold this last week, I might feel, I might figure out that like oh, the, their value might be a little higher than where I initially set it. And so just trying to feel out where, where that's yeah. at. I think um, we have a market, but I think we have a good breed, yeah. a good market that is in, it's in demand. It's fairly rare in yeah. our area. Yeah. So I think that we could sell them easily and for a good, good yeah. price. Um, I, I would say I would. I would say we would sell feeders, um, but we haven't been approached a lot about people wanting feeders. Yeah. And we've, our, and our flock is so small that it's like, we have a small customer base that wants the lamb. And actually we have more customers that want lamb than what we have for sale. So it, it's kind of trying to like figure that out and then also look at it from the point of like, well, what actually do we want to do? And yeah. I mean, in talking about all this balance stuff, like maybe, maybe we're gonna, maybe we'll move towards selling the lambs at an earlier point as feeders or as breeding stock and just keeping, you know, however many we're going to butcher for ourselves. And, um, I don't know. I mean, we we're all of it has been a learn as you go, as far as the farm goes and what's, you know, what do we want to do for ourselves? But then also like, from the business perspective, like what's actually profitable. Yeah. Um, because I, I have a heart for like wanting to, when I start doing something that I enjoy myself and see the benefit of, I want to share that with other people, but it does, then you can, things can get out of balance quickly where it's like, Oh, I want to give, I want to share. But like, I, you know, what, what's paying the price for, that level of, of doing that. And, um, what I found is that for the most part, it's my own sanity and my family mm -hmm. <laughs> that pays for that. So you have to, it is learning how to balance that. And when I, when we sold those, that breeding stock, I was like, Oh, well, that was kind of nice. <laughs> and I was like, maybe that's, maybe that's where we're, where we're heading here. So, you know, I don't know. If all of our plans go and our pastures get better and we get better at breeding and get more lambs, yeah, then in, and the pastures getting better would mean a better nutritional status of the ewes so that they can easily have bigger lamb crops. Yeah. Then I see raising feeders and breeders as more and more of our future. Yeah. One of the things we have right now actually is that we are in our family is in direct competition with our customers for our lamb meat. <laughs> yeah. We have this balance between what do we keep versus what do we sell? Yeah. And we, we had sous vide lamb chops. It's called a sous vide. Sous vide. Sorry. Yes. It's and a, and we, it's we like had a, a method of cooking. We had a friend and yeah. it's like the most tender way to prepare meat. And so it was just like, Oh, this is why we raise sheep. You know, this is why we went outside yeah. and moved sheep in 95 degrees and got all sweaty and gross and yeah. came inside and he had made that force is like, so oh, the, 
That's why we're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> where Where are you at again, Alyssa? Remind me. I'm never. I it have was a hard. Mo- Malacca. Oh, Malacca. Not, not too far away. Not too far. Yeah. So, um, maybe you private message us and we can uh, figure that out. Um, if you wanted to see about getting a couple lawn mowers to to give it a yeah, give it a go. Um, you definitely would want at least two because they really, uh, can get weird all by themselves. That's what people but, who sell, sell animals say to people who buy it. <laughs> no. You need at least two. And then you got two, you may as well have, well, how many do I have? 50. You well, need no, 50. Because remember. Okay. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's chicken math with all animals, right? Yeah. Anyways. Um, but Yeah. Send us a message and we can we can talk about what we've got and uh, when you're for when this you're... year or for next year. Well, I would think for more for next year because I think we've pretty much got things planned out. Um, I guess if you just wanted lawnmowers, year, we could we could see about renting some. Well, no, she was like, she said because she want they want to try the meat. Oh yeah, but okay. they don't they don't want to like do all the breathing and everything until they know that they really like it. Yeah. Well, sheep are the new hotness and homesteading. Yeah. I gotta say it. Yeah. We were right on that one. <laughs> it was like investing in gold in 1900. So best way to do grass fed animals that, you know, that's interesting because it's hard to change the way that you grill like steak and that sort of stuff because it's different. The fat profile, the meat is different. Yeah. So you can turn a twice as expensive piece of meat into a half as enjoyable piece of, you know, cooked meat very quickly. Yeah. And so Jerry, actually the guy who made the, made it for us, he actually said the, the contraption, the sous vide only costs like $80. It's not expensive, but I think there is a, a little like learning curve to learn how to use it. I don't like that you're cooking it at moderately high temperatures for a long time in like a plastic bin in a plastic bag. Yeah, that's not I, my favorite. I don't either. really want, but I don't really like that. Like you could change the bin to a metal bin, but you still kind of have to cook them in like a shrink wrap vacuum sealed sort of or zip, yeah. Ziploc bag or something. I didn't really. I wonder if you could use like silicone bags or something. I don't know. Would that be better? I don't know. Well, maybe, but I don't know if you can get them thin enough that you could cook the meat very well. Oh, that's true. I don't know. There's probably somebody out there that's figured it out. If not, somebody on here, an enterprising person can figure that out and make a million dollars. It's delicious though. And I mean. Like don't even need a knife. Just just bite it right off. It's got to be better than microwaving. Like microwaving in plastic. <laughs> well, for sure. <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're probably going to 50 bucks. And yes, you can use silicone reusable sandwich bags. See? All right. Can you do fish? Like all that fish from Alaska? Can you can you do like salmon in a sous vide or something? Or would that be a bad idea? Do you want to stick with red meats? We recently did a freezer clean out and I found some wild caught salmon imported directly from Alaska to Minnesota that I purchased and summarily forgot about. Uh, and Karen doesn't eat salmon. So I'm looking. No, the, I should, don't say I don't eat it because I have always tried it when it's been available. I just don't like it. Well, I mean, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, yeah. Like it, I'm not like. And smoked salmon is the best kind of salmon. I'm not like I won't touch it with a 10 foot pole. I just have tried it and I genuinely don't like it. When I go to a coast where I can get fresh fish, I eat fish. It's difficult here in Minnesota because it's not Kathy says, fresh. yeah, they can sous vide fish. Um, yeah. Stick some butter in the bag with it. That sounds Laura good. said that Jerry, like a few weeks ago, made pork chops in the sous vide and she said it was the best like piece of meat she's ever eaten. Well, I and like, normally she doesn't like pork chops at all because they get dry and whatever. And... I like that he was able to do all of that lamb in one batch and yeah. fed 12 people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like 
some of these things, like we're a big enough family with old enough kids now that it's like one pot isn't enough to cook dinner in. Right, right. And I like that he was able to eat all the meat. And it's cool because it just sits over in the corner while you're doing something else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great. It's quiet. Doesn't release any fumes or anything. Uh-uh. Uh, yeah. And so that's 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 kind of... I, I was really impressed. Butter and, you in know, the bag. I've had people... Okay. I've had people at work that talk tell about it. I have a, you yeah. know, talk about it all the time. Yeah. But I, I always thought that it was something that was going to cost me several hundred dollars and, and I didn't want to mess with it, but kind of sounds like it's in the repertoire of, of, uh, kitchen enthusiasts and Karen loves kitchen gadgets. Randy loves kitchen gadgets. He loves to buy kitchen gadgets and then he wants to know why there isn't room in the kitchen for them. <laughs> I keep telling him he needs to get me a new kitchen. That's true. <laughs> the, the, the biggest, the kitchen gadget we need the most is just a fresh a, salmon a kitchen at that the works. Fish processing house. I got spoiled by fish. And yeah. Fish. yeah. I, don't, I don't like eating fish. At, yeah. Like they have salmon and stuff at restaurants here in Minnesota and it's just not the same. Well, but like when we go to Seattle fish. and stuff, freshwater fish in Minnesota, when you know, it's like locally caught and everything. Well, but that's so the thing. Good. There is no such thing as locally caught fresh fish in Minnesota. There isn't. No, like if nobody, you, if you like, get walleye or catfish, it's never or rainbow local? trout. That's what you get, right? The walleye comes from Canada. Oh. The catfish comes from some farm. And who knows where the trout comes well, from. Well, I trout. feel like I've been lied to. I totally thought there was local fish being served somewhere no you can't go and fish like sportsman's fishermen like we do in a lake and then go sell it at a restaurant that's illegal i will say this there's a possibility that we get <laughs> that we could get be getting fresh local walleye from the indian reservation oh, okay because they do commercially fish yeah i don't know wish you would have videotaped jerry making it um, it was not jerry at all it was Dr. Jerry. Dr. Jerry. Yeah. He is a, a a doctor who helps people and a doctor in the kitchen. He knows his way around around food. His food looks like the stuff that they photograph and put in magazines. And it's on, like on websites. you like eat it and you can't help but like mm, like oh my goodness, this is the best thing I've ever had. Like you want to go it's make so macaroni and cheese for the kids so that there's more for you. Yeah. Of the good stuff. Yeah. And our kids don't even like macaroni and cheese, so maybe that yeah. wouldn't work. Yeah. Went fishing in Dutch Harbor in high school. Fresh halibut. Oh, my. It sounds like we need Ooh. to go to Alaska, honey. Yeah. Why, why haven't you <laughs> why taken me there? Why aren't we here? <laughs> well, our 20th anniversary is coming up two years from Monday. Do you want to go to Alaska or Hawaii? Both. Okay. Why do I have to choose, Randy? <laughs> <laughs> Halibut steaks or fried chunks. See? Yeah, yum. What do you mean, yum? I've had halibut and liked it. Haven't I? No, what do I have? You don't like any fish. No, that's not true. I prefer freshwater fish. Um, I have had some seafood when it was, like, local to the area where we were that I liked. I don't like salmon. I, I, I always try it if it's available for me to try it. I don't order it myself because I've never liked it enough to want to order it, like have it and then feel like I would waste it. But I always try it and I don't care for it. But she didn't like, she didn't care for sushi I, either. Haven't I had halibut? I'm pretty sure you've had all of it. I've had, I I've never I've, had fried isn't halibut. Hal, isn't it like a white it's fish? It's a white fish. Yeah. yeah, I've had halibut and I liked it. Yeah. She will never preferentially order that at a restaurant. I will. Though, when there are hoofed animals on, but you on the But you order it and menu. I try it and then sometimes I say, ooh, that's good. And I do like walleye. Yes, walleye is good. Yeah. Freshwater fish. I think, I think she just said that I should probably go get a boat that I can walleye fish in. And actually, I have to learn how to walleye fish because I don't really know how to do it. Yeah. I think she just told me that I need to buy some more like fishing gear. As soon as I have a kitchen to cook it, to, <laughs> that is adequately supplied with all of the kitchen gadgets. All the things to, to cook walleye in. Cook right? the fish in. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. we can't get the cart before the horse here, honey. That's true. Yeah. Fresh salmon is very different. Doesn't taste fishy. Parmesan pear sauce. Well, Ooh. Well, now I'm going to have take, to get a sous vide. Take me to Alaska and I will have salmon. Okay. See if it, see if I like it better. Will you go on like a guided fishing trip with me and we can catch it and then we can cook it? Sure. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't mind fishing. It's not like my, I'm just dying to get out there and fish, but I do enjoy being on the boat. Last year, me, you, and Elsa went out, and it was yeah, like, I'm, it was I so didn't fun. force you to fish or anything no. like that. I don't even think you did. But if you want to Instagram at home or Instagram in the boat or well, enjoy it out on the water or whatever, that's fine. It's just, it's fun just to be together. Yeah. I've just never spent enough time actually fishing to feel like I would have a high success rate. And therefore, on the occasions I do go out, I'm not like... There isn't like the anticipation of the catch because I don't really anticipate catching much. <laughs> so I'm just happy to be in the boat. I like I like boating. Well, next Friday, yeah, we will not be here. We will be boating. We will with the whole family on a big old pontoon. Maybe boat. we'll pop on live for just a moment and say hi to everybody and show them the lake that we're on. I'm on a boat. <laughs> It'll just be us yelling for five minutes. Look at we're on a boat. I sail. <laughs> All right, everyone, we're coming up on two hours. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Uh, we have to get ready for a baseball tournament tomorrow. Yes, the kids we to bed. Do. And again, we appreciate you. And we're going to come on and come as, you know, sometimes do this and sometimes not over the summer. As and frequently as we can. Yep. We, yeah. we really enjoy it. So it's kind of hard to say no to it. But it we is. also, uh, you know, like part of the discussion need to have that balance where it's not it's not stressful to do this. Yeah. Um, and where it's something that can be enjoyable for us and enjoyable and educational for you guys as, as well. So uh, if you're new to this, you want to go back and see some of our other live streams. They're all long. Yeah. They're all us just ch chatting it up for think, hours and hours. I think on we end. had a moment on like the second or third one where we were like, okay, we're going to keep it short. And then, and then we, we just realized just kidding. So now, <laughs> now we just talk and we have fun and people can come and stay as long as they want or as long as they're able and enjoy it. And if we're talking about something that you just are really interested in stick around or go back and watch it later if you have time and then you can fast forward through times if we're rambling about something else yeah. or whatever but so yeah. if you go to youtube.com slash c slash randy Kleiman slash videos and then click on here on past live streams you can find the other daily growers and what we have done with how those. many have we done we have done one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We, this is our eleventh live stream. Oh, hey! How cool is that? I didn't number eleven. I didn't, I didn't realize we had done that. I didn't either. So much. This is the one that started it all over here. The Friday night hangout with Randy. Yeah, and I was out of town, and I was like, "What's with you doing this cool, fun thing without me?" <laughs> but look at this: 121, 124 views, 150, 128, yeah. 200, 203. 112. Awesome. This is the one where, this is the one down here where we were in the barn for the whole show. This is the one where I had my lovely barn correspondent, Karen, give us an update on the lambs while I was in the Daily Grower Studios. I didn't feel like that worked out as great. Oh, but I wanted it to work so bad. I know. It was so we much, might, it would we be might so need much to fun. practice it a few times when we're not totally live and yeah. see if we can get it to work really well. We learned that the cell phone is not the greatest not. mobile remote setup. So yeah, Karen's got an, got a computer and we got an extra uh, webcam. So next time we do that, we'll set her up with the full deal. Like we have here, we got the fancy camera. Or maybe I'll we'll send you thing. outside and you can leave me inside. Yeah. Okay. And then if it cuts out, you'll come back and it'll be a surprise about what I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, all she needs to do is stick to the show notes and we'll be good. There. I've got my own notes. It's okay. Yeah. 
All right. Really? Where? You've never brought notes All to the show. All up here, baby. <laughs> All up here. I don't need. I don't need your printed off notes. That's right. Well, we could do a live correspondent from the garden and do a garden update. We should do that. And it actually would be kind of fun to take everybody out to the pasture and just show them. Because they saw the lambs in the barn. So then to see like how they're doing out on pasture would be fun. Yeah. But, okay. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. Yes. And we love, Good having, to see ya. love having you. Love talking with you. And it's really fun to be out here and be building a community. Yep. Along with Daily Grower. And yeah. So enjoy your night. And thanks for having us. And thanks for making it two hours in to the live stream. <laughs> two hours and two minutes. So. We always have a good time. Yeah.